Bonjour, my friends, another week, another episode of the Wine Science Commentary. My name is Lawrence, and as always, I've got a highly interesting topic for you. How can you influence the spiciness of your wines with different winemaking techniques? Is it even possible? We will find out. Grab yourself a glass of wine, lean back, relax, and see you in a second on my screen. Cheers. Okay, so the first paper we will look at was published in 2011 in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry. It's called Relationship of Changes in Rotten Don Content During Grape Ripening and Winemaking to Manipulation of the Peppery Character of Wine. Head researcher here, Lorenzo Caputti, obviously Italian guy. And then let's go on with the introduction. So here they say that recently a very interesting sesquiterpene ketone called Rotten Don was identified as being responsible for the peppery aroma in grapes wine, herbs, and spices. Not so recently anymore, but however, this is how the molecule looks like. It's like a B-cyclic structure with a ketone group here. And then furthermore, they say that the sensory thresholds are extremely low, 16 nanograms per liter in red wine. So yeah, quite similar to those of IBMP. And the uh, Rotondon aroma is so potent that if you would basically put a drop of this compound in the swimming pool, you could still smell it. Yeah, obviously it's found in Syrah, Movedra and Reef, but at a much higher concentration in these Italian varieties such as Copentino and uh, Vespolina and also Grinovatlina, of course. But in this study here, they used yeah, Vespolina, which is a red grape autochthonous to the northwestern part of Italy. You find it in the Piemonte region, for instance, but only yeah, 100 hectares or so are planted and it's commonly blended then with a Nebbiolo. Rotondone concentration in must and wine may depend on several factors such as cultivar region and mesoclimate. It is assumed that the intensity of its characteristic aroma could be modulated by careful management of the wine and winemaking techniques. All right, let's look at that. Research was conducted over two years, guys, in 2009 and 2010. 2009 was a very ripe vintage, very hot all over Europe, not just in Italy. So we have much higher yeah, ripeness here expressed and bricks and then compared to the colder vintage 2010 and then here we see the accumulation of Rotondon um, starts at the onset of variation and kind of reaches its peak here at harvest and we have the highest Rotondon concentrations found in the 2010 vintage which is also the cooler vintage so it seems that cool vintages favor the accumulation of Rotondon and then Let's look at this year. So the, the vineyard, I have to say, was planted over foothill and hillside part. And here you can see that the hillside part was slightly riper, got slightly more sun than the yeah, bit more unripe foothill part. And this is also seen here. So again, Rotondon accumulation starts at the onset of erosion and doesn't really stop at technical maturity here, but even increases to the overripeness of the berries. And the hillside berries showed a higher concentration of Rotondon compared to the foothill berries. So there's also a kind of a mesoclimatic um, impact here. So you have, a, you have a variation of Rotondon concentration even in one vineyard. Then let's look at some winemaking. Table 1 shows the Rotondon concentration and yield during the winemaking process. So in 2009 at the hillside grapes, we see that in the grapes we have something like micrograms per kilogram. And then once we go on with our winemaking, we end up with nanograms per liter in our final wine. So a drastic decrease, drastic decline of Rotondon from the grape to the final wine. And in the must stage, we have tiny, tiny, tiny concentrations of Rotondon because Rotondon is highly hydrophobic, so it doesn't solve or dissolve in water. It's not extracted in aqueous solution, but once you gain some alcohol, you see some extraction going on and you have an increase here. Um, but another decrease once you start pressing because it seems that Rotondon gets absorbed by lees by uh, yeast cells or uh, yeah, skins and seeds and all that kind of stuff. And then here they had a filtration going on and then again in the final wine you end up with a lower concentration 
um, compared to the to the to the pressing um, point. So that means that once you filter your wine, you further lose rotundon. So if you're looking for high rotundon levels for um, more pepper in your wine, then you should consider maybe not to filter or do a, only a soft filtration process. So far, so good, guys. Let's jump over to the second paper. So the second paper is called Impact of Winemaking Techniques on Classical Analogical Parameters and Rotundon in Red Wine at the Laboratory Scale. Published in 2016 in the American Journal of Enology and Viticulture. And the head researcher here was a French guy called Olivier Chefroy. And he had some help with uh, from some Australian colleagues from the Wine Research Institute. Um, and yeah, Olivier, he is actually a, um, yeah, a, a teacher and researcher at um, yeah the engineering school of Purpan in Toulouse. Yeah, quite a handsome young man, very nice guy, um, very practical guy. Also traveled around the world, um, yeah, making wine all over the world. And uh, since 2011, he conducted a bunch of research in the field of Rotondon. So if you have any questions, uh, email him. He's uh, quite friendly and always um, has an answer for you for sure. Let's jump into the introduction part. Here they write that Rotundon is most likely to accumulate in grapes in cooler vintages and in cooler vineyards. Exactly, that's what we saw in the first paper already. Then there are huge clonal differences in terms of Rotundon concentration. And uh, Rotundon uh, might be involved in the vine's natural defense mechanism in response to powdery milieu attacks. And it increases with the ripening of the fruit and is not impacted by grape thinning. And leaf removal has been shown to strongly lower Rotundon while irrigation enhanced the concentration. It also appears that most of Rotundon is extracted from the berries between day 2 and 5 of fermentation, which corresponds to the period when ferments are reactive and ethanol levels are increasing. Yeah, that's um, exactly the point here. Uh, Rotundon is highly hydrophobic and um, only is extracted with ethanol. Uh, material methods, so they took grapes here from the southwest of France, um, from the Gaillac region here, and um, yeah, then they fermented um, the wines under laboratory scale, meaning in a one liter Erlmeyer flasks, they had nine treatments. So they had a control vinification, which is the standard treatment at 25 degrees for eight days. Then there's a pectolytic enzyme addition treatment, a cold soak treatment, and then a thermovinification treatment. I think they had, um, they used uh, 70 degrees temperature for about two hours here. Then they had this elevated temperature treatment vinification at 30 degrees for eight days. Then um, yeah, extended vinification treatment at 25 degrees for 14 days. Then a semi-carbonic maceration treatment, a rosé vinification treatment, and then a fermentation with Saccharomyces uvarum yeast. So this is this cryo yeast, this um, yeast which is able to ferment at very cold temperature conditions and also produces a quite, um, yeah, diverse flavor profile as it seems. All right, so far so good. So let's look at some tables here. Here we go. So table one shows the impact of winemaking techniques on conventional analogical parameters. And um, yeah, let's start here. We have the highest ethanol content in terms of alcohol by volume in the thermonification treatment. This is not very surprising because here you extract a lot of nitrogen compounds and amino acids which favor the fermentation conditions. And then also in the pH, we see the highest level in the thermovinification treatment, meaning here we have a bunch of potassium extraction going on, which then binds to tetraic acid and put, um, precipitates as potassium tartrate. And then the lowest pH value in your rosé treatment, because you have lower potassium extraction going on here. Highest tartaric acid extraction again in thermovinification. And yeah, this is what I wanted to show you that anthocyanins, again, this cold soak treatment here does not favor the extraction of anthocyanins. Um, that's what we already saw in one of my first videos. Um, so watch that if you want to learn more about cold soak. And then how do our rotundon levels behave according to the treatments? We see that in the control, enzyme in the cold soak treatment and in this 30 degree um, yeah, elevated temperature treatment 
we don't have any differences here, so not significant differences. And uh, this is quite this is quite interesting because we, we, we think that if we increase the temperature, we also extract more, but this is not the case in rotundone concentrations. The levels are a bit lower in the 14 days, so in this ex extended maceration treatment, in the carbonic treatment and in the Vadon treatment. This also um, is interesting because you think you extend the time of your fermentation or or you have some yeah some extended skin contact going on. But what happens here is that your rotundone gets absorbed on the gross lees. So you look this this treatment lowered the rotundone concentration compared to the control, for instance. And then the, the lowest levels of rotundone we find in the thermal treatment and in the rosé treatment. All right, rosé treatment. This is yeah, this is clear why this is because we separate skins from the juice early on, and in the skins obviously we have our rotundone, so we end up with lower levels here. And the thermal vinification seems to not favor rotundone extraction. Okay, so heat does not mean you extract more rotundone. Um, so far, so good. Um, what are our conclusions here? Let's go up here. So, compared to control wine, the rosé and thermo treatments had the largest impact on analogical parameters. These two treatments involving a pre-ferment removal of skins resulted in the lowest wine rotundone concentration. The other treatments had a weak impact on the studied parameters and none of them, including the use of macerating enzymes and the increase in temperature or time of maceration, resulted in enhanced rotundone concentrations in comparison with the control treatment. This means that efforts to maximize rotundone in wine have to be conducted in vineyards. Pre-fermentation, heat treatment and semi-carbonic maceration were not favorable in enhancing rotundone concentration in wine. Okay, so the take home message is here that you cannot enhance your rotundone levels in wine when you apply a different um, analogical treatment. You can just preserve your rotundone levels and you have to enhance the rotundone levels in the vineyard, meaning you have some different, te different techniques here that you can use. Um, yeah, grape thinning seems to lower the concentration of rotundone whereas irrigation, for example, seems to favor the accumulation of rotundone, so you have to find a good balance. And also, in the first paper, we saw that fermentation, uh, sorry, that filtration has a negative impact on rotundone um, concentration in your final wine, so you want to avoid that if you're looking to preserve your rotundone levels. Okay, guys. This was our weekly episode again. I hope you enjoyed it, guys. If so, please hit the like button down below. And uh, stay safe, stay hydrated. Please support our industry by drinking a bunch of wine. And have a great week. See you next time.